Hello listeners, it's podcast time again. Welcome back to my show. This is a podcast for learners of English as a foreign language or learners of English as a second language or learners of English as a third language or fourth language or just other language. If you are learning English and it's not your first language, then this is for you. And uh, this episode, well, I've been meaning to do this one for ages. It's been about three and a half years, really. Uh, so uh, back in 2019, before COVID even happened, uh, I did parts one and two of this series. And then I didn't do part three. And, uh, and so finally, here it is. OK, now let me start reading from the uh, notes and scripts stuff that I prepared for this episode. You'll find all of this stuff on the page for this episode on my website, by the way. So just look in the description of the episode, either in your podcast app or on YouTube, wherever you're watching this, you'll find a link to the episode page. And that's where you'll find all the notes and transcript stuff and everything that I'm reading from. OK, so let's start reading from that then, shall we? I say we, I mean me, although you can uh, read it too if you like. Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. This episode is called 88 English Expressions That Will Confuse Everyone, Part 3. And in this episode, we're going to go through some expressions and idioms that apparently only British people know and which confuse everyone else. And that means learners of English, but also other native speakers from different countries, particularly the USA. These expressions seem to be unique to the UK for some reason. Now, as I said earlier, this is an episode that has been a long time coming. And hello, Francesco Gator. Francesco is a long-term listener who has, <laughs> uh, well, for a while, he kind of um, kept asking me to do part three of this series. And I kept saying to him, yeah, 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 it's on my list. I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to get round to it. So hello, Francesco. I'm finally doing it. Uh, as I said before, this is actually part three of a series I started bloody ages ago before COVID came along. And I always intended to finish it off, but never got round to it. So over three and a half years and about 200 episodes later, it's time to finish what I started. And you might be thinking, why did it take you so long to finish the series, Luke? Well, I've said before that this podcast is a bit like a big ship that's barreling across the ocean. That's the sound of um, Luke's English podcast, if it was a massive ship. So it's like a big ship going across the ocean. And if I leave something behind, for example, if, if someone or something falls overboard, then it takes a very long time to slow the ship down, turn it round and go back. It's kind of like a big boat or a train. You know, is that a train or a horse? I don't know. It's a, it's a train with a horse running alongside it, like some kind of Indiana Jones film or something. Anyway, it's like a huge train. And if, if I drop something or if I leave something behind, then it takes ages for the train to slow down and stop. Uh, the way that I make my episodes, it's like one episode come, I publish one episode and then instantly I get other ideas for other episodes to do. And if I leave a, a series unfinished, then uh, for some reason it's very, it's very hard to stop the whole thing, turn around and come back. Um, but anyway, here we are returning to finish this series, 88 English expressions that will confuse everyone. Essentially, this is an episode about British slang. Uh, this should be useful for you from a cultural point of view and to help you understand native British English speakers. It should also just be a bit of a, a bit of fun, to be honest. So I hope you enjoy it and that you find it interesting to learn about some of our more obscure and weird expressions. Now, should you actually use these expressions in your speaking? This is an important question when learning slang or idioms. Should you add them to your active vocabulary? Um, right? You've got active vocabulary and passive vocabulary. Passive vocabulary is, is basically all the language that you know, but you don't necessarily use. For example, it's, it's really important to have a very, very wide, broad, extensive passive vocabulary. It helps you to understand things and you can kind of draw from it too if you need to. Um, but it certainly helps you to understand. It's like really important to have a huge uh, pool of passive vocab. 
Um, but should you should you use all this language in your active vocabulary? Now, obviously, this is completely up to you, but it's worth considering what kind of English you should a be able to understand and b actually use. This depends on the context in which you're using English. If you want to be able to be under if you want to be able to understand British people when they speak, then this is the stuff for you. If you just love English and find it interesting to explore the idiosyncratic aspects of the language, then go for it. But slang isn't exactly global English. And by that, I mean the kind of English that most non-native speakers would understand, like the language of international business, for example. And for most people out there learning English, um, you'll probably be using English globally, right? Using English with other people who don't have English as a first language. So you'll be using a sort of international global version of the language. Uh, but some of you will be using it with British people. For example, if you live in the UK or if you're just sort of like mixing with British people. Right, so the, the, the slang stuff isn't really global English. Um, okay, uh, so these expressions might be a bit confusing and weird for other non-native speakers, depending on their level of English. But again, it's completely up to you. And after all, the tagline for this podcast is Real British English. So here you go. This is the kind of stuff that you might notice in TV shows, song lyrics, books, or just the things your English mates or English colleagues say, if you have any uh, uh, mates, I mean, if you have any English friends. And if you don't have any friends, that's okay. Don't feel bad. Um, so I, parts one and two have already been done, as I said. Uh, part one of this was episode 624, and part two was episode 625, and then here I am, something like ep episode 820-something with part three. Um, so as I said in part three, if you'd like to listen to parts one and two, huh? So as I said, this is part three. If you'd like to listen to parts one and two, you can just find them on the episode page, or just search for episode uh, 624 and 625 in the episode archive. Now, all of this stuff is based on an article I found on independent.co.uk. The Independent is a newspaper. So they published an article a few years ago, which was called um, something like uh, English expressions that will that confuse everyone. Right. And I thought, ah, that could be an interesting subject for my podcast. Let's look at all these expressions explain them to help everyone understand them so that you don't get confused by them. Okay, so I've basically taken the content of the article and added loads of stuff to it. So if you are if you're looking at the page for this episode on my website, then all the text which is written in italics has been pasted from the original article and you'll find the link for that article um, on the page for this episode. So all the stuff in italics is from the original article. The rest of it is all mine. By the way, there is a video version of this episode on YouTube. And if you're on YouTube watching it, you're going, yeah, I know, I'm watching it. But if you're in podcast land, if you're in audio land, then uh, there is a video version of this, like there normally is now nowadays for my show. Um, you'll find the video version on YouTube and it's, it's embedded on the website page as well. Um, okay. So the first thing then, this is the, the, the rest of that list of 88 phrases. The, the next item on the list is a pea super. A pea super. Watch out, it's a real pea super out there tonight. A pea super. This is a thick fog or smog, often with a yellow or black tinge caused by air pollution. Okay, a pea, it's a real pea super out there tonight. Now, I should say that this is an old fashioned expression and people don't really use it much anymore. But it does pop up every now and again, usually in films and TV series which are set in the past. I think Amber, my friend Amber, said it on the podcast once as well. A pea super. So, the idiom, a pea super, was first used to describe the thick, choking smogs that settled over London caused by lots of people burning fossil fuels in a close vicinity as early as uh, 1200, the year 1200. The smogs were compared to pea soup due to their colour and density, right? So 
This is a bit of a stereotype or cliche of London, isn't it? That it's foggy. It's not really foggy anymore. In fact, since the Clean Air Act of 1952, an act of parliament, a law which was brought in to clean up the air in London, ever since then, the um, we haven't you know haven't really had that kind of smog or fog um, that we used to have. Okay, uh, so pea soup. Pea soup is very thick. It's a thick green soup, right? Made from peas. It's very thick and can be a bit yellow in colour if you're using dried peas in the recipe. So this is why a fog which is very thick and even yellow in colour uh, used to be called a pea super. The fog or smog was so thick that it looked like it looked like pea soup. Ugh, yuck. Smog, by the way, this is a portmanteau word, a mix between the word smog. Uh, huh? No, a mix between the word smoke and the word fog. Smoke and fog. Put it together, you get fog. Uh, no, huh? I'm confused. Smoke and fog. Put it together, you get smog, don't you? Right. Okay. So you know when in the you know uh, in a city with lots of industrial factories pumping out smoke or lots of homes all pumping out smoke from their fireplaces that smoke comes out into the atmosphere it combines with naturally occurring fog right which is a kind of which is like cloud uh, near the surface of the ground you know cloud near the ground so the smoke mixes with the fog and you get smog I mean, we still we get smog in a lot of cities. A lot of polluted cities have that kind of yellowy, dirty looking air in the sky, especially when you look at the city from a distance, you can see this uh, layer of smog. So that's that's smog, right? Um, pea soup. So um, be careful when you're driving. It's a pea souper out there. Now, I would never actually use this phrase unless I was imitating a London cab driver from the 1950s or 40s or something. Watch out. At, be careful out there tonight. It's a pea super. The expression was much more common in those days because very foggy weather was also much more common. We don't often get fog like that in London these days, really, because the air is much cleaner than it used to be. I've said this already, but I'm going to say it again. Just in, just in case you missed it the first time. This is one of the stereotypes of London, thick fog. It's the sort of thing that comes up in American TV shows and films. In many Americans' minds, it seems, London is still this foggy 18th century place full of penniless pickpockets, greedy bank managers and cockney prostitutes. And fog, foggy London town, as people sometimes say. But it's not really true anymore. Well, the weather bit. The pickpockets, the bank managers, and the prostitutes is probably still true. Um, all the Google News searching I've done for this expression has returned the same results. Articles about the great smog of 1952. So when I um, am doing episodes like this, when I am teaching vocabulary, often I will look for examples and I'll go to Google News and I'll search for the phrase in there and see if the expression has been used in articles or other websites. And that often turns up some quite nice examples of the phrase being used. Searching for P Super in Google News only gave me articles about the great smog of 1952. In 1952, there was a big smog in London. Very, very, very thick. It's actually what prompted the Clean Air Act to be passed. So this isn't as much a history lesson as it is an English lesson then. Um, what was the great smog of 1952 and how did this pea super expression end up in the language? Here are some details from Wikipedia. Pea soup fog, also known as a pea super, black fog or killer fog, and also London particular, in the case of pea supers in London, is a very thick and often yellowish, greenish or blackish fog caused by air pollution that contains soot part particles. Soot is the um, soot is basically the residue that is produced by burning coal. It contains soot particles and the poisonous gas sulfur dioxide. This very thick smog occurs in cities and is derived from the smoke given off by the burning of soft coal. Coal is a kind of fuel, black rocks that burn. So it's given off by the burning of soft coal for home heating and in industrial processes. Smog of this intensity is often lethal 
to vulnerable people, such as the elderly. Lethal means it will kill them. It's lethal to vulnerable people, such as the elderly, the very young, and those with respiratory problems. That means breathing problems, like asthma, maybe, or emphysema. The result of these phenomena was commonly known as London, as a London particular, or London fog. The Clean Air Act. The worst recorded instance was the Great Smog of 1952, when 4,000 deaths were reported in the city over a couple of days, and a subsequent 8,000 related deaths, leading to the passage of the Clean Air Act 1956. Okay, not, not 1952. The Clean Air Act was a law which controlled pollution in London and was vital in changing the air quality of the whole country. And it banned the use of coal for domestic fires in some urban areas. The overall death toll from that incident is now believed to be around 12,000. The phrase has cropped up in various bits of popular culture over the years. Charles Dickens, uh, Charles Dickens' story Bleak House, when Esther, when, it, when the character Esther arrives in London, she asks of the person meeting her whether there was a great fire anywhere. For the streets were so full of dense brown smoke that scarcely anything was to be seen. Oh dear no, miss, he said, this is a London particular. I'd never heard of such a thing. A fog, miss, said the young gentleman. There's an example in um, Sherlock Holmes. Okay, the Arthur Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes stories describe London fogs, but contrary to popular impression, the phrase pea soup is not used. A Study in Scarlet, 1887, mentions that a dain, uh, mentions a dun-coloured veil hung over the housetops. Dun, I suppose this is like. What is dun? Is it like dung? What's dun? Oh, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a word for a dull greyish brown colour. Okay. Um, the Adventure of the Bruce Partington Plans, another Sherlock Holmes story, 1912, describes a dense yellow fog that has settled down over London and later notes a greasy, heavy brown swirl still drifting past us and condensing in oily drops on the window pane. Ugh. While in The Sign of Four, 1890, Holmes soliloquizes, meaning he thinks and talks out loud, what else is there to live for? Stand at the window here. Was ever such a dreary, dismal and, and unprofitable world? See how the yellow fog swirls down the street and drifts across the dun-coloured houses. And later in the same story, the day had been a dreary one and a dense, drizzling and a dense, drizzly fog lay low upon the great city. Mud-coloured clouds hung over the muddy streets. So this is the sort of literature that would have inspired that cliché about London. Sounds awful, doesn't it? God. Uh, the Fog plays a role in Michael Crichton's 1975 novel, The Great Train Robbery. Michael Crichton, famous writer, he wrote Jurassic Park. On the evening of January the 9th, a characteristic London pea soup fog, heavily mixed with soot, blanketed the town. Um, in the book The Woman in Black by Susan Hill, which is a great little uh, horror story, which I recommend. The second chapter of the book um, is titled A London Particular and mentions a thick, dense fog of London, which Arthur Kipps witnesses on his journey to work at his solicitor's office. The references go on. Um, Neil Gaiman is a British writer of fantasy fiction stories, and um, he wrote a book in 1996 called Neverwhere, which is a really good book. I, I recommend it. And there's in, in that book, there's, there's London and there's London Below, which is another city beneath London. So sections of London below in Neil Gaiman's 1996 novel Neverwhere are still affected by pea supers, remnants of the thick fog in London's past that got trapped in London below and remained. And then The Crown, if you are, um, if you've seen The Crown on Netflix about the royal family, 
the expression P Super turned up in series one. Um, in episode number four, the events of the 1952 fog deaths and their political ramifications take up the whole of the episode. That's probably the most well-known example. Let's have a little, let's have a listen to the trailer. The time is eight o'clock on the 6th of December and here is the news. London has been brought to a halt by dense fog, which has descended overnight. Long queues have formed on main roads, and there are reports of motorists abandoning their vehicles and continuing on foot. London Airport is expected to be closed. Good God. The Meteorological Office has issued a statement saying that a persistent anti-cyclone over London is to blame. Smoke from the capital's chimneys is being trapped at street level, which is aggravating the fog. Windless conditions mean it is expected to last for some time. Be careful out there. It's a real pea super. All right. Careful out there, Squire. It's a real pea super. So if you wanted to speak like a kind of an authentic Cockney from London in, you know, the first half of the last century, you might want to speak like that, Governor. Careful out there. It's a real pea super tonight. There you go. Be careful out there, it's a real pea super. London fog is now a bit of a cliche and we don't get that much foggy weather since the air is now a lot cleaner or at least the pollution we have now doesn't create smog like it used to. So pea supers and foggy London are now a thing of the past. A question for you. How's the pollution in your city or country? Do you ever get pea supers there where you are? Let's move on to the next one. Pinch, punch, first of the month. A pinch, a punch, first of the month. Okay, uh, have you ever heard that expression before? Yeah, huh? What? A lot of British people will be like, oh yeah, pinch a punch the first of the month, fine. Now this is a rhyme that people say on the first day of the month. Okay, it's the first of whatever, the first of uh, May, first of June, first of July. When you see someone, the first time you see them, and if it's the first of the month, you can say, a pinch, a punch, the first of the month. So this is a rhyme that people say on the first day of the month. It's sort of a good luck tradition, or maybe just an excuse to punch someone in the arm. For some reason, we never did this in my family. And so pinch, punch, first of the month is almost a kind of foreign, is almost as foreign to me as it is to you. Although I'm familiar with it, but I just never have used it. It's the sort of annoying thing that a kid in school would say to you while inflicting physical pain on you by pinching and then punching you in the arm. Pinch, punch, first of the month and no returns of any kind. It's a school playground rhyme, often exchanged between friends on the first day of a new calendar month, accompanied by a pinch and a punch to the recipient. And as usual with this sort of thing, there are rules. So if the joker, that's the person who says a pinch a punch the first of the month, if that person forgets to say no returns of any kind, the recipient can say a slap and a kick for being so quick, accompanied by a slap and a kick. Got it? So if it's the first of the month, you say to someone, pinch a punch and a foot, a pinch, a punch for the first of the month. And if the, other person goes, if the other person goes, ah, a slap and a kick for being so quick, that's legal. But you can block it by saying a pinch, a punch for the first of the, num for the, first of the month and no returns. Then they don't have the right to kick you. Now, why on earth people would do this kind of nonsense to each other, you might be thinking or asking? Well, it's to protect everyone from witches, of course. According to the Metro newspaper, the playground ritual originates from the medieval times when nobody knew anything about anything. Most people were completely illiterate and education was only something the richest of the rich could afford. And even the schools were probably full of unscientific, superstitious nonsense too. So yes, uh, medieval times when a pinch of salt was believed to make witches weak and the punch resembled banishing the witches entirely so that they don't come back. As a result, pinch, punch, first of the month was a way of warding off witches and bad luck for the near future. 
Nowadays, it's mostly a way for kids to pull pranks on their friends. It's basically an excuse for punching your friends. Pinch punch, first of the month. Ha, a slap and a kick for being so quick. There you go. Now, do you have any weird little superstitions relating to the first day of the month in your country? I wonder. Next is maybe something a bit more familiar, and that, that is the word pissed. He's pissed. Oh, I'm pissed. Now, this is one for the Americans, really, and I expect that most long-term lepsters, most long-term listeners to this podcast will be aware of this one. So, pissed usually means angry in the United States. However, in the UK, someone that's pissed is most probably drunk. Leave him alone, he's pissed. He can't drive, he's pissed. So here's another expression that means drunk. And you can add it to all those nouns as adjective words that posh people might say, like trolleyed, gazeboed, rat assed and the other expression which was, what is it, mortal in Newcastle and probably the surrounding areas. You can see part check part two of this series for all of those other words to describe someone who's drunk. Um, right? Pissed. Now, this, this word is very common and it's used a lot. I would definitely use this as a slightly uh, rude alternative to the word drunk. It's a bit ruder than drunk, right? Because the word piss is technically a rude swear word. Uh, it's actually, piss means urine, right? Uh, to have a piss. Uh, some piss on the floor, but to be pissed means to be drunk. Oh, I'm feeling a bit pissed, to be honest, you might say. Like, if they started drinking at six, they'll all be pissed by now, for example. Remember, in the USA, or in American English, pissed usually means annoyed. The English equivalent of that is pissed off. We add the off in British English. I should say the British English equivalent there. Um, is pissed off. So if you add off, it means annoyed. So in America, it would be like, oh my God, I'm so pissed right now, but probably in a slightly better accent. That means I'm so angry. And in the UK, we would say, I'm feeling so pissed off today in the UK. Although I think they sometimes say pissed off in the USA as well, right? But in the UK, we would never say pissed to mean annoyed unless we were speaking in American English. He can't drive, he's pissed, for example. So when was the last time you got pissed? Have you ever been pissed, meaning drunk? And what pisses you off about life in the place where you live? Right, for example, what pisses me off is uh, the fact that people don't queue very well in, f in Paris. Remember the word pissed is quite rude. It's a slightly rude word. Okay, moving on to the next expression, and it is to pop your clogs. Now, to pop your clogs means to die. Clogs are like wooden shoes, aren't they? They're kind of famous in... Um, the, the, the Netherlands is famous for its clogs, traditional footwear from Holland. Uh, these wooden shoes, those are clogs. To pop your clogs means to die. Hmm. Now, this cheery phrase is widely believed to originate from northern factory workers around the time of the Industrial Revolution. When they were working on the factory floor, employees had to wear hard clogs to protect their feet. Now, the word pop has evolved from the word cock, and when someone cocked their clogs, it meant that the toes of their clogs pointed up in the air as they lay down dead. Did you hear what happened to John's old man? He popped his clogs, didn't he? Again, this is an example of how the story of the meaning of the word is maybe more weird than useful. But I suppose people used to die quite frequently in factories. And so this phrase became quite common. I'm trying to think of a reasonable situation in which you could use this phrase today. Normally, you wouldn't use a phrase like this if you're trying to be respectful about a death. For example, if you're talking about a friend or a loved one who died, you wouldn't say the expression pot. Oh, God, you know, oh, are, you, are you feeling okay? Oh, I'm just, oh, I don't know, I don't know if I can work today. It's like, wait, what's the matter? It's, oh, it's my dog. He popped his clogs yesterday. Oh, oh, that's a, that's a pity. 
Um, so you wouldn't really use it to talk about death in a respectful way. If you're talking about death in a more respectful way, we would say passed away or passed on. Um, so instead, this phrase is for situations which are not too serious. An example from a non so uh, from a not so serious account of Queen Victoria's life. Uh, Queen Victoria's wild royal sex diaries revealed. This is from the New Zealand Herald on the 25th of May 2019. Sadly, Victoria's sexual walkabout with Albert ended in 1861 when he popped his clogs and she was heartbroken to have lost her great love. So yes, that, that article in that New Zealand newspaper is obviously intentionally being disrespectful because it's not being serious, right? But um, it's true that um, Victoria and Albert uh, were together until he popped his clogs in 1861. Hmm. Okay. Next, poppycock. Poppycock. P O P P Y C O C K. One word. Absolute poppycock. Now, something that is nonsense, rubbish, or simply untrue might be described as poppycock. This quintessentially British idiom derives from the Dutch word pap and kak, Dutch words, pap and kak, which translate as soft and dung. Dung is animal poo. Right, so poppycock basically means bullshit then. What a load of poppycock! Uh, I don't know, I might use this phrase. I might do. It's definitely a slang phrase. It's quite a funny phrase. Having done a bit of research into this, it seems that they do use it in the USA as well, and no doubt in Canada too, and other English-speaking places. So I wonder if actually American people would b really be confused by this word. Here are some examples of people saying poppycock from youglish.com. Uh, Let's have a listen. He seeds, and he said, oh, poppycock. Or something stronger, if you know what. Yeah, bullshit. It was sheer poppycock. Uh, Lincoln was... Stanton's uh, principal defender in the administration. One of the case's most famous aspects are pure poppycock. It's certain that the attack occurred and mm -hmm. the Some people might admit to praying and other people might say it's poppycock. Most of that is poppycock, but the true story of Atlantis is almost as weird. So you can see like uh, of those examples, the, I think five examples there, three of them were American English. So they do use it in America. Um, here are some other words that mean nonsense. We could add poppycock to the list of words meaning nonsense, which also includes balderdash, which is a very old fashioned word, uh, codswallop, baloney, bollocks, which is a rude word, bunkum, claptrap, cobblers, drivel, fiddlesticks, gibberish, guff, hogwash, piffle, tosh, tripe, and twaddle. What absolute twaddle? Meaning you're talking nonsense. Don't give me any of that old tripe. That is total tosh. It's, it's just piffle, hogwash, guff, gibber. He's talking gibberish. Absolute drivel. Listen to the drivel he comes out with. It's cobblers. I'm, I tell you, total claptrap. Complete bollocks basically. Okay. If you want more information, you can check glossophilia.org. So do you have lots of words for nonsense in your language? Or does English just have more nonsense than other languages? You know, it's like the way the, they say the Eskimos have got 100 words for snow. For some reason, uh, in British English, we've got 100 words for nonsense. Is that just because we have more nonsense than other places? I wonder. Do you have lots of words that mean nonsense uh, where you're from? Let's move on to the next expression, which is quids in, quids in, to be quids in. So someone who is quids in has invested, an has invested in an opportunity which is probably going to benefit them massively. So quid is British slang for pounds. For example, five quid means five pounds. Okay, so for example, if it all works out as planned, he'll be quids in. Basically, if you are quids in, 
it means you've made some money. It's the sort of thing I might say if I've gained some money. Like at the end of a comedy show, you might say, ah, oh, quid's in, when someone hands you some cash that's been collected at the door. Normally at stand-up comedy shows that I do, we do the show, it might be free for the audience to come in. We do the show and we say to them, okay, it was free to get in, but guess what? It's not free to leave. Ha 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 ha. Uh, but then you stand there with a with a bucket or a hat or something at the door and as people come past you sort of hope that they will drop some money into the hat and if it's a, been a good show at the end of the show you empty the hat and you look oh we're quids in tonight meaning we've made lots of money tonight there you go quids in let's move on to the next word which is a round now, if any of you know anything about going to the pub, then you will have heard this one. It's like one of the most common things that people say about British culture, that when you go to the pub, you buy drinks in rounds. So this is a good one, though, and it's important if you're going to the pub in the UK. You might buy a round of drinks for your friends at the pub in the understanding that they will each buy you a drink as part of their rounds later on. So you might say, like, whose round is it? Is it Steve's? Steve, it's your round. And Steve says, no, I've already bought a round. It's your round. So there you go. We buy drinks in rounds. You go to the pub, you go to the bar. What are you having? What would you like? What do you want, mate? Okay, I'll get these. We buy drink. No. And then later on, your friend says, oh, I think it's my round. I'll get them in now. So um, what about in your country? Do you buy drinks in rounds? I expect that you get a bill at the end right? Rather than having to keep going back to the bar in order to uh, order more drinks, right? Do you do it that way? What do you do? Do you go to the bar, buy some drinks, the drinks are given to you, you hand over the cash, <clears throat> you're done, you bring those drinks to the table, or do you sort of like uh, pay for the drinks at the end? How do you do it where you're from? Do you buy drinks in rounds? Next is the word shambles or a shambles. So a sham it's, it's an absolute shambles. Uh, a shambles is a disorganized mess or chaotic environment. Like, what's, what's happened here? This is a shambles. For example, Brexit is a shambles. My first lessons as an English teacher were a bit of a shambles, to be honest. They were. Oh, God. These days, I'm much more in control of my, my method. Uh, but in the early days, my lessons were a total shambles. Even just like keeping con keeping all my my notes and worksheets under control would have been a shambles. I wasn't very good at. See, there are there are lots of skills involved in English teaching. Not only lesson planning, understanding language, understanding classroom management, communication skills, board work skills, but also photocopying skills. A lot of photocopying gets done, and you have to learn how to use a photocopier properly which means being able to like automatically staple all of your things together. Uh, Double-sided photocopies, automatically stapled, with holes punched in them, all that sort of thing. So my early English lessons were all, often a bit of a shambles because I didn't have any of those skills under control, really. Um, oh, I'm so glad <laughs> that it's not like that anymore. Um, the way that England play football in the World Cup is often a bit of a shambles although they've been getting better in recent years. Uh, Boris Johnson is a shambles, and so is his government, or so was his government. And his hair as well is a bit of a shambles, isn't it? Goodbye, Boris. Anyway, next, uh, we've got the word shirty. Like a shirt that, that someone might wear, but shirty is an adjective. Someone short-tempered or irritated might be described as shirty. Also, we say to get shirty with someone. Like, don't get shirty with me. It's not my fault. For example, it's like, I'm not shirty. You're the one who's getting shirty. The meaning of this slang word has been debated at length, apparently. The word shirt is derived from the Norse word for short. Hence, short-tempered, right? If someone is short-tempered, it means they get angry quickly. Like, he, watch out, he can be a bit short-tempered in the morning before he gets his coffee. He can be a bit shirty in the morning. Right, so the word shirt does come from the word short. However, other people believe that the word shirty has connotations of being disheveled. Disheveled means not neatly presented. So 
uh, disheveled means creased, unironed, in a bad mood. Like Boris Johnson has got disheveled hair. Intentionally disheveled, I should say. He intentionally messes up his hair, but his hair is certainly disheveled. So uh, some people believe that the word shirty means disheveled. Other people think it just means short, like short tempered. We don't really know what the origin of the word is, but there it is. Don't get shirty with me, you might say. So when was the last time someone got shirty with you and why did they get shirty with you? Um, are you a bit short tempered sometimes? Like maybe in the morning before you get your coffee or something? Do you get shirty with people? When? In the mornings? Do you ever get shirty in a customer service situation if you feel like you haven't been given the right kind of customer service? Okay, who do you get shirty with? Um, an example from me is I got shirty with a guy who jumped ahead of me in the queue in the supermarket here in Paris. But I can't argue in French, so I couldn't do anything about it. Oh, I have a lot of queue... Uh, what's the word for it? Q anxiety. In the UK, when you go to the supermarket or other situations where you have to queue up, generally people will lock in to the queue. They just lock straight in. So there's the person in front, the person stands directly behind them. There's probably some kind of mathematical formula for the, for the, the way you're supposed to stand behind someone in a queue. Like there's probably like a central axis point and you have to line yourself up with that central axis point, um, not too far away from the person in front of you, right? And so the queue then has a mind of its own. It can go around corners. If you follow that axis point rule um, in France, in, certainly in Paris, it seems to be a little bit more relaxed and maybe a little bit more uh, um, sort of uh, shambolic, right? That's the adjective for the word shambles. Um, and I often find that I'll be standing in the queue and the person behind me is not following the axis point rule and they stand behind me but sort of slightly off to the side as if any second now they could just accidentally on purpose just step forwards and jump ahead of me and that happens all the damn time. Another problem is that often queuing systems are not properly regulated um, and people take advantage. So in the local supermarket, what we've got is a situation where on the right hand side, there are a number of tills. Tills are the places where you pay for your shopping. You know, that's where you put the basket next to the till. The person who's working at the till beeps the shopping through and you put it in the bag and then you pay, right? These are the tills. So they've got these tills on the, on the right hand side. And on the left hand side, there are self-service machines. Right now, for me, and the way that the shop is designed, clearly, there should be one queue. And whoever gets to the end of the queue can choose either to go to the, to the um, operated uh, tills, where there are customer service people, you know, sales assistants, um, or you can go to the self-service tills. But what happens so often that it drives me mad is that you'll be in the queue and a, a self-service till becomes available on the left and someone peels off from the back of the queue to join the self-service tills. Like, in what universe is that okay to do that? And no one seems to care. I'm the only one who's, you know, getting all shirty. And it happened, um, it happened once when I was standing there and a, a load of people, suddenly like three or four people came off the back of the queue to join the self-service tills, which suddenly became available, like someone switched them on in the morning. And all these people just came off the back of the queue and I, was, I couldn't believe it. And so I, normally I'm, I just sort of suffer in silence because I'm not confident enough in French to have a confrontation with someone. Plus I'm not a confrontational person. So that sort of thing really makes me uncomfortable. But on this particular occasion, I, in my unconfident French, I basically said, uh, excuse me, um, the queue is here. And um, the guy instantly turned around and got right up in my face. He started eyeballing me right up in the face. And he said to me 
in French. He said, oh, you have to choose, you have to choose. Meaning, his logic being that, uh, I don't even know what that means, you have to choose. But in his twisted uh, logic, it was basically, you can choose, you can jump the queue if you, if you use these ones. And there's sort of two queues. There weren't two queues. And because I couldn't control myself and I didn't have control enough over the language, what I would have said is like, don't be ridiculous. There's one queue and everyone's in the same queue. So don't tell me that you have to choose. You don't have to choose. It's just one single queue. Now you're blatantly queue jumping. Get to the back of the queue, please. I'm next. Is what I could have said, but I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. So I, I went red in the face and I gave him the Robert De Niro. You're thinking, what's the Robert De Niro? That's basically when you go, you kind of just stare at him basically with a very, um, <laughs> I don't know. You know the actor Robert De Niro? He's in gangster films and stuff. So anyway, he, t he has a certain kind of expression on his face, which involves the, your, your mouth being turned downwards looking kind of uh, intense, looking away, breathing through your nose. I just gave him the Robert De Niro and he, you know, like that. He, I don't think he cared, but oh, I, I, I mean, and that was my attempt to get shirty with someone in a queue in Paris. Um, next is the word skew whiff, skew whiff, S-K-E-W dash W-H-I-F-F. Something that is skew whiff is askew, meaning wonky, not straight. Like you'd say, is it just me or is that that painting's a bit skew whiff? So I wonder if any of the any of the frames, the pictures and frames I've got in my pod room are a bit skew whiff. They might be. I think that that one over there might be a bit skew whiff. The one behind me. Um, is it just me or is that painting a bit skew whiff? Skew whiff just means you know, not perfectly straight. It's maybe a bit wonky. Okay. Um, now, Francois Hollande used to be the president of France years ago. Uh, these days, of course, it's Emmanuel Macron at the moment anyway. But Francois Hollande used to be the president of France, but it seemed he was quite unpopular with French people. I don't know if that's largely true, but he didn't seem to be the most popular president and I often wondered why and whenever I asked French people about him they would almost always say something about his appearance or that he's not presidential enough and I worked out that he was unpopular mainly because he couldn't wear a tie properly his tie was always a bit skew whiff and that seemed to be the one of the main reasons and um, you know as, that's the most coherent reason I could get from from French people when I said, "Why don't people like Francois Hollande?" And they was like, "Well, he's he's just not very presidential." And, blah, blah, blah. and basically, it comes down to he couldn't wear a tie very well. His tie was always skew whiff. So clearly, looking presidential is one of the main qualifications for the job, right? Of president to be a good president, you have to look like a good president, apparently. And there we see a picture of Francois Hollande with his tie, his wonky tie. It's not that bad, is it? Yeah, Francois Hollande. Yeah, he, uh, uh, Francois Hollande also uh, famously had an affair while he was the president. Uh, he had an e extramarital affair. Was he married? Anyway, he had an affair. Uh, he had a mistress. And it was a bit of a scandal in France at the time. And I thought, yeah, a bit of a scandal. He's having an extra, ma he's uh, having an affair. You know, he's cheating on his wife or girlfriend. Yeah, but, it, but no, that's not what the French were worried about. In fact, the fact that he had an affair was like fine. That's good, in fact, you know. Um, no, the problem was the way that he did it because he was, uh, I think he was filmed or photographed uh, having an affair by driving to, to a, uh, an apartment on a scooter. He drove a scooter with a, with a big scooter helmet on. That was the problem. It's not that he was having an affair, it's that he drove to an apartment to have an affair on a scooter, which again is not very presidential. So uh, skew with tie, drove a scooter 
um, those are apparently the two main problems that people had with uh, Francois Hollande. I'm sure his economic policy was not good as well for some people, but anyway. So there you go. Skew whiff. Look around the room if you're in a room right now. Are there any pictures or paintings on the wall that are a bit skew whiff? A bit wonky? Hmm. Next is the word skive. Skive. S K I V E. It's a verb to skive. In fact, to skive off. To skive off school. So, skiving is the act of avoiding work or avoiding school, often by pretending to be ill. Another expression is to play truant. Playing truant is the more formal uh, phrase for it. So, to skive or to skive off. Um, skive apparently is derived from the French esquiver, meaning to, to slink away or to wriggle out of something. Basically, to avoid doing something you don't really want to do. Like, for example, there's a big training meeting at work. Everyone's expected to come. But if you skive off, you just like don't go. Or if you wriggle out of it, it's like, oh, I'm afraid I can't because my cat's, my cat's aunt's, uncle's, kitten's, grandmother's uh, dog is having a funeral. So I'm really sorry I can't come. So you manage to get out of it or wriggle out of it. Or just, you know, to, to skive off. Yeah, like, for example, I'm skiving off work. Uh, skive off school is very common. He skived off school so we could all go to Thorpe Park on a weekday. Um, Thorpe Park is, a, is like a sort of British version of Disneyland. So there you go. Did you ever skive off school? Have you ever skived off school? I never really skived off school, but I definitely skived off at college when I was 16, 17 years old. In fact, I spent, my, my college was right next to a park and I spent more time in the park than I did in the college, hanging around with my cool friends, being the cool guys, skiving off classes. I paid for it in the end, of course, because I failed my A-levels spectacularly. Next is the word slump or slumped. To be slumped. Um, hmm. Okay, now according to the independent, slumped is an adjective which means lacking in energy, usually after a long period of exertion. Now I'm, like for example, you know, do, you, do we have to go to the dinner, to, do we have to go to the dinner party tonight? I'm slumped. Now actually, I would use the word slumped, but not to mean exhausted. So I would never say that. I'd never say, oh, I'm absolutely slumped tonight. I personally wouldn't say that. Instead, I would use slumped to describe someone's body position. For example, to be slumped over, to slump over a desk. This means to lean or to lie or to sit so your body is completely lifeless, as if you've just died or passed out. Slumped over. Right. Imagine if someone's just passed out at their desk. They've been working so hard or they've been listening to Luke's English podcast for such a long time that finally they just pass out and just. Are you all right? You, you know, I found him. He was slumped over his desk with his headphones on, slumped in the corner. Like that. OK, so if your body is lifeless or something like that. I'm sure that in the quote unquote recent detective story episodes, that's 612 and 614, Victorian Detective 3, um, in those, in those uh, episodes, I'm sure the word slumped came up. You can imagine someone slumped over their desk because they've been studying English so hard that they've passed out or they've just been listening to an especially long episode of Luke's English podcast. For example, the students were all slumped over their desks. The teacher was slumped over his desk. There was even a guy slumped in the corner holding a grammar book. What happened here? I wondered. Then I realised it must have been an English grammar lesson. Ha ha ha. So, is it considered rude to be slumped over your desk in your country? Right? If Imagine a language class. Um, would it be considered rude if, if, if someone was slumped over their desk? 
Now, maybe I'm going to get something wrong culturally here. I don't mean any offence, so you can um, you can just uh, correct me if I'm wrong about any of this. But it always used to alarm me or sort of surprise me to see my Korean students slumped over the desks during break time, especially if they had their heads on the desks. So when I was an English teacher in London, I had multinational groups of students from all over the world, and we'd study, we'd do grammar and whatever. And then there'd be break time and I'd come back to class after break time and sometimes I'd see some students kind of slumped over on the desk with, even with their heads on the table. Some students slumped over the desk, forehead on the table like that. And I thought they'd just given up. I thought, oh my God, it looked so like awful, like they'd passed out. I thought, oh my God, they've given up. Or they, they, they hate this, they're finding this so hard but apparently they were just resting. Or maybe genuinely they just couldn't stand my lessons, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, what do you think? I mean, Korean listeners, and I'm talking to you specifically because it always seemed to be the Korean students that would do that. Slumping over your desk with your head, your forehead on the table at break time, what does that mean? Okay, does that just, does that mean I hate this? Because from my point of view, that's like a desperate, oh my God, are they okay? Uh, or does that mean I'm working hard? I don't know. You can tell me. Does it? Is it? Was it an indication that they didn't like my lessons? I'd like to know. Uh, next, we've got the word smarmy. Uh, smart. Oh, he's. Oh, I don't like him. He's all smarmy. So someone that comes across as scheming or untrustworthy might be described as smarmy. He's such a smarmy bastard, isn't he? smarmy, mm, sort of like slimy and untrustworthy, maybe someone who's kind of making plans like evil plans and also someone who's kind of charming as well, but in a negative way. Now, although the adjective's origins remain largely unknown, early documented uses seem to use the word as synonymous with smear. So to smear something, for example, I don't know, smear. So if you've got paint, you get paint on your finger and you rub it on something, you would smear the paint. Um, further suggesting that someone who is smarmy is also slick or slippery. Don't trust him, he's a smarmy git. So Draco Malfoy from um, Harry Potter is a smarmy little git. Jacob Rees-Mogg, the politician is a really smarmy politician. Oh. oh, let's move on from that. I think I just threw up in my mouth a little bit at the mention of Jacob Rees-Mogg, the smarmy bastard. Uh, James Bond is not smarmy exactly. He's classy, isn't he? But there are plenty of blokes who fancy themselves as being classy like James Bond, but they just come across as being smarmy, don't you think? So do you know anyone who you could describe as smarmy, like oh, a real smarmy guy? Imagine a slippery, maybe slimy, charming, but disreputable person. Next is the word sod's law. Sod's law is a British axiom or British saying that boils down to the idea that basically means if anything can go wrong, then it definitely will go wrong. Now, Sod's law is often used to explain bad luck or freakish acts of misfortune, like sudden moments of bad luck. This is more commonly known in the US as Murphy's law. For example, if, you, if you, you've just made some toast, you've put butter on the toast and you drop it, ah, and of course it, it lands butter side down, doesn't it? It's just Sod's law. I mean, it's, a, yeah. Here are some situations in which, here are some situations, we don't know the word, we don't need the word in here. Here are some situations which would count as sod's law. So dropping your toast, it always falls butter side down. Or when you have to choose a queue at the bank, for example, you've got three or four different queues or at the bank or post office, or when you have to choose a queue at passport control at the border, the queue that you choose always ends up being longer than the queues you didn't choose. 
So, for example, you look at the four queues and you think, oh, there's fewer people in that queue, I'll go there. And then, of course, all the other queues suddenly go down really quickly. It's Sod's Law, isn't it? In the USA, they would probably say Murphy's Law, which could be a bit offensive because Murphy is an Irish name. And so this might count as an ethnic slur, a rude expression which offends a certain ethnic group, uh, in this case, the Irish. Um, also, Sod's Law could be a homophobic slur as well. Sod referring to a homosexual in a rude way. So, hmm, not sure that's one you should really add to your active vocab, but people do say Sod's Law, isn't it? Hmm, just another way of saying, like, bad luck that always happens. For example, great, it's been dry all summer, and on our wedding day, it decides to pour with rain. It's sod's law, isn't it? For example. Next is the phrase, a spanner in the works. A spanner in the works. A spanner. Uh, I don't actually have any, sp I don't have a spanner that I can show you. But if you need to, let's say you've got a skateboard or a bicycle and you want to remove the wheels. It, let's say it's a bicycle. How do you remove a wheel from a bicycle. If it's not a quick release one, you'd need to get a spanner to undo the nut that holds the wheel in place. You, you put the spanner on, undo it, and then you can take the wheel off. In some countries, you call a spanner an English key, um, but a spanner. So a, pa a spanner in the works. A spanner in the works, this is an event that disrupts the natural pre-planned order of events. Okay, something that disrupts the natural pre-planned order of events. Something which disrupts all the plans. So you've got, here are the way that things have been planned, here is how we expect everything to happen. But if you throw a spanner in the works, it means you ruin everyone's plans and you complicate the situation. Okay, so the phrase describes the mayhem caused when something is recklessly thrown into the intricate gears and workings of a machine. So the literal meaning of a spanner in the works is this. The works means the complex uh, inner workings of a machine. For example, the cogs and cables and wires and things that all move inside a machine. And if you throw a spanner, a metal wrench into that, complex machine and it's all gonna uh, seize up and stop working properly. So he threw a spanner in the works literally, but also you can sort of um, metaphorically throw a spanner in the works as well. For example, by getting pregnant, Mary threw a spanner in the works. Or, um, you know, you make a suggestion at a meeting and, it, oh God, you really threw a spanner in the works with that question, didn't you? You complicated things and you, um, you, 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 you uh, upset the plans or upset the way that things were supposed to go. In the UK, it's a spanner. In the US, it's a wrench. I understand that in Spanish, you call it an English key. Is that right? Um, so, for example, I was planning a world tour of stand-up comedy shows, but then the COVID-19 pandemic threw a spanner in the works. Okay? I was planning a world tour of stand-up comedy shows, but then uh, COVID-19 threw a spanner in the works, didn't it? I think it threw a spanner in the works for a lot of people for a lot of reasons. Okay, moving on. Next expression is to spend a penny. S just hold on one moment. I just want to go and spend a penny. Okay, to spend a penny is a polite euphemism or phrase that suggests something else. So it's a euphemism for going to the toilet to do a pee, do, to do a wee-wee, to spend a penny. The phrase goes back to Victorian public toilets, which required users to insert a single penny in order to operate the lock. Okay, so you had to pay to get into the toilet and it cost one p, one penny. Now, although it sounds crude, the phrase is actually considered a polite way of announcing that you're going to visit the bathroom or toilet. Historically, only women would announce that they were going to spend a penny, as only women's public toilets required a penny to lock. 
men's urinals were free of charge. So women might say, I'm just going to spend a penny. I'm just off to spend a penny, meaning I'm just going to go to the toilet. Here are some other uh, euphemisms for urination. You might say, I've just got to go take a, I've got to go and take a slash, or I've got to go for a slash. I'm going to have a slash, take a slash, or go for a slash. Uh, a slash or a waz as well. Have a waz, have a slash. Those are quite co colloquial phrases for doing a P. Uh, to answer the call of nature. Nature is calling. That means I need to go to the toilet. And obviously then we have to pee or to wee or to piss, which I said earlier on, slightly rude, that one. I'm going to test you. When I finish going through this list, I'm going to test you on this, okay? So I hope you're paying attention. Next is to splash out. Now this has nothing to do with the previous expression, don't worry. Uh, but to splash out is a quite a nice phrasal verb and it means to, to spend money. To splash out means spending significant amounts of money on a particular item or event. And if you're splashing out, it's implied that you're spending money on a treat to mark a special occasion or a celebration. Wow, you've really splashed out on this party. Or it might be, oh, it's my birthday today, so I've just felt like splashing out, you know. Right? Splash the cash. Just spend a lot of money normally because you're celebrating. Note, it's to splash out on something. I splashed out on a new camera. Okay, for example, I've been working super hard recently, so I decided to treat myself and splash out on a new guitar. Which is actually true. I did that. I splashed out on a new guitar the other day. Maybe I'll sing a couple of songs again uh, at the end of episodes, like I used to do. And some people are going, oh, that would be nice. And one person is going, no, please, no. It's all right. If I do, I'll probably do it at the end of an of episode so it doesn't bother anyone. Anyway, have you splashed out on anything recently? Or are you saving up for something? What's the last thing you splashed out on? I wonder. Um, next is the word SWOT. S-W-O-T. And it's a noun. A SWOT. A SWOT. It's similar to a nerd or a geek, but it's less derogatory, meaning less negative. Someone that takes academic study very seriously might, might be described as a SWAT. So a SWAT is someone who studies very hard um, at school or at college or something. A bit of a SWAT. Uh, to SWAT can also be used as a verb. Normally to SWAT up, to SWAT up on something. For example, I haven't seen Tom since he started revising for his exams. He's turned into such a SWAT. And yeah, he's, he's been swatting like mad for his Spanish exam. Or he's been swatting up on his Spanish. There you go. Do you have like, do you have a word in your language for the same thing? What would you, what word would you use to describe someone who studies a lot? In English, it's a SWAT. Next, uh, to take the biscuit. Well, <laughs> That certainly takes the biscuit, doesn't it? Um, so, uh, what does this mean? Well, if someone has done something very irritating or surprising in an exasperating fashion, you might say that they've taken the biscuit. Does that make sense? Probably not. So basically, taking the biscuit is the equivalent of taking a non-existent medal for foolishness, stupidness, or incredulity. Like, congratulations. If you could award a medal to someone for doing something really stupid, you would, instead of saying, well, you know, he deserves a medal for that, you would say, that takes the biscuit. Okay, for example, I could just about deal with the dog barking at 5.30 a.m., but the lawnmower at 3 a.m. really takes the biscuit. Mm-hmm. Trying to think of other examples of this. Oh, that really takes the biscuit, doesn't it? That really takes the biscuit. Hold on a minute. I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to consult ChatGPT. Can... Oh, they say we're experiencing exceptionally high demand. 
Please hang tight as we work on our on scaling our systems. Maybe maybe this isn't going to work. Can you give me uh, three example sentences with the phrase "take the bis biscuit" in British English? Let's see what it says. Will it be able to do that? Here we go. While we wait, I will drink from a massive bottle of water. Here we go. Mm. After all the lies he's told, this one really takes the biscuit. So it's like getting an award or giving an award for a really bad thing. After all the lies he's told, this one really takes the biscuit. Another example. I thought I'd seen it all, but this new company policy really takes the biscuit. Mm -hmm. Boris Johnson has said some ridiculous things, but this latest thing really takes the biscuit, doesn't it? Another example. When he turned up late for the third time this week, that really took the biscuit. So it's like the thing which wins the award for being the most stupid or negative thing. Okay. All right. Now let's go back to my list as we thunder through these examples. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine more. Okay. What was the what was that one? Take the biscuit. Okay. Let's continue. So we had take the biscuit. Next is take the Mickey. Ah, uh, um, do you know this one? You should do. Quite a useful one. Uh, by the way, I would definitely say take the biscuit. I would definitely say take the Mickey. I would use the word SWAT. I would say splash out. Definitely uh, spend a penny. Yeah, I would probably say that. Throw a spanner in the works. I would say that. Um, it's Sod's law. Not really sure. I would say that just because of that slightly dodgy. Um, uh, um, reference to the word sod, you know, which does relate to uh, 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 sort of old fashioned attitudes towards homosexuality. Smarmy. Yeah, definitely. Like that Jacob Rees-Mogg is such a smarmy bastard. Um, uh, slumped over to be slumped. I wouldn't say slumped meaning exhausted. I wouldn't say I'm slumped. I would only use slumped to describe someone's body position. Uh, to skive off. Yes, I would say that. Uh, skew whiff. That Picture frames a bit skew whiff. Uh, it just remind me to put that right later. Don't get shirty with me. He's getting so shirty. Yes, definitely would say that. A shambles. I tell you what, that work, that meeting was an absolute shambles. Yes, definitely. Uh, a round. I'll get the first round in. You can get the next round. Yes, I would say that. Oh, quids in. As someone gives me loads of money after the comedy show. Um, Poppycock. I wouldn't say that so much. Uh, from the list, I would say probably what a load of bollocks, although it's rude. Uh, absolute uh, drivel, uh, gibberish. Um, yeah, those are the ones I would tend to use. OK, moving on, moving on, moving on. We're moving back to take the mickey. Let's go back to that. So to take the mickey means to take liberties at the expense of others. Hmm. This is according to The Independent and can be used in both a light-hearted and an irritated fashion. Huh? Don't take the mickey. So for me, taking the mickey is the same as taking the piss. OK, so here's the thing. Taking the mickey, taking the piss, making fun of someone and joking, right? They all mean the same thing. But there's kind of two things going on here. So, for example, if I was making a, making jokes about someone, it's like, oh, I like your hair. Did you do it yourself? It's like, you know, sure. oh, I'm only taking the mickey, meaning I'm only making fun of you. I'm only joking, right? That's one meaning of take the mickey. But also another meaning of take the mickey would be a bit like 10 pounds for a cup of tea. Are they taking the mickey? Right? Are they taking liberties? Basically, are they, are they being serious? You've got to be taking the mickey. Ten pounds for a cup of tea. That's ridiculous. Take the mickey is an abbreviation of taking the mickey bliss, 
which is Cockney rhyming slang for take the piss. So to take the piss is the more rude version and take the mickey is just another version of the same thing, just with a different word. Or oh, don't take the mickey. Ah, oh, it's all right, I'm just taking the mickey. Meaning, I'm just making fun. Or, are, you, are they taking the mickey? For example, you know, you're waiting for your train and then it says an announcement on the, on the message board. It says, the train's been delayed three hours. Three hour delay, are they taking the mickey? Okay. Next is the word tickety-boo. Everything's tickety-boo. This is like one of those phrases that Americans love to imagine that British people are saying all the time, isn't it? Americans love to imagine that we're all going around going, what, you know, like, pip, pip, old chap, everything's tickety-boo, cheerio. That's how they think we talk to each other, isn't it? Uh, tickety-boo, I would, I'd never say tickety-boo, but it is a phrase that people use quite a lot. If something is tickety-boo, it means everything's satisfactory and it's in good order. Everything's fine, everything's okay. So this classic British idiom may seem stereotypically twee, meaning kind of cute and old-fashioned. However, some sources believe that tickety-boo in fact derives from the Hindu phrase thick hai babu, meaning it's all right, sir. Which is quite possible, isn't it, really? Because, you know, the Brits did have a, a presence in India, um, in the Indian subcontinent with the, in, during the old colonial days. And so a lot of, like, phrases from that part of the world will have made their way into the language. Everything is thick, high, babu, meaning it's all right, sir. Maybe some of the locals would have said that quite a lot, and that kind of turned into tickety-boo in English. Everything's tickety-boo. I hope everything's fine, grand, splendid, and tickety-boo in podcast land. Maybe I should say that at the beginning of episodes. Hello, welcome to a new episode of Luke's English Podcast. I hope everything is tickety-boo in podcast land today. Is it, listeners, is it? Is it tickety-boo? Now, maybe don't think about that too much, because the more you think about it, the more you might realise, actually, wait a minute. You want me to analyse the situation in my country at this point? Well, things are distinctly not tickety-boo, Luke, if I'm honest. But anyway, at this specific moment while you're listening to this episode, I hope that things are basically tickety-boo. But you can comment, can't you? Next is the word waffle. This is a good one for this podcast, and I do use this a lot. Waff First of all, a waffle is a kind of food, right? A waffle is... Um, is a, is a Belgian thing, isn't it? Um, it's a sort of, uh, it's, it's kind of like pancake mix put inside a mold, which creates a sort of um, um, a checked pattern, right? And then you eat it with syrup and butter and cream and ice cream and yum, 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 yum. So that's a waffle. But here the word waffle is a verb. And waffle means to speak in a certain way. It's a lot like ramble. Waffling is basically talking and talking without saying anything very important. So when someone makes a great speech while skirting around a subject or without saying any, uh, anything of any value, you might say that they're talking waffle or that they're waffling. For example, in some of my older episodes, when I, I used to waffle a lot more in the introductions of my episodes, these days I try and keep it a bit tighter. But certainly in, the, in some episodes, like the one called Ghost Stories, there's a lot of waffle at the beginning of that. And every now and then, I'll notice that a native English speaker, like an English person, has stumbled across my podcast and started listening to an episode. And they don't really get it, you know, they, do, they just don't really get the whole thing. Whereas I think learners of English sort of understand that that waffle I do sometimes in episodes is there to help you warm up and help you focus on what I'm saying. It's some light-hearted speaking that's designed to pull you in and engage you, right? And that waffling stuff has a certain function as, you know, um, uh, for English teaching. But some native speakers will listen to my show and this is like, it's just lots of waffle. Um... So I have had that. Too much waffle is what people write sometimes. In the 17th century, to waff meant to yelp, meaning to sort of shout. 
and quickly evolved to mean to talk foolishly or indecisively. I wish he'd stop waffling on, what a load of waffle. Other words for this are rambling and prattling. There you go. I'll, I try not to waffle too much uh, these days unless I've done an episode specifically devoted to doing just that. Next is the word wally. Uh, I quite like this one. It's a way of, it's an insult word, but it's not really offensive. Now we've got lots of offensive insult words, words we can use to describe someone. Don't be such a hmm. You know, I'm sure you can think of some words already which are too rude really. But what about words that do the same job but aren't really that rude? So we've got words like wally. So someone who is silly or incompetent might be described as a wally. Oh God, what a wally. You stupid wally. Don't be a wally. What about its origins? Well, although its origins are largely debated, the term's meaning has evolved over the last 50 years alone. In the 1960s, someone that was unfashionable might be nicknamed a wally, according to dictionary.com. But these days, it's just anyone who's a bit silly and a bit stupid, right? For example, don't put down a leaking mug on top of the newspaper, you wally. Or, um, you know, don't spill, look, you're spilling coffee everywhere, you silly idiot, you wally. Wally, Burke, Muppet, um, Wally, Burke, Muppet, Tool, T-O-O-L. These are all words that you can use to say that someone is stupid and they're not really offensive, rude words. Oh, you Wally. Oh, you Muppet. Oh, you Tool. Oh, you stupid Burke. I quite like those non-rude, rude words. Um, next is the word wangle. Wangle. It's a verb, to wangle something. If you've wangled something, it means you've got it through clever, in a clever way. You've managed to get something cleverly. So it could be like free tickets to a show. Or maybe free tickets or, or an upgrade to business class on a plane. For example, oh, I, I wangled some free I wangled some first class seats by being nice to the cabin crew. Look at what I got. I wangled a couple of free tickets to wangle some free tickets. Moving on to whinge. This is what my daughter does if she's not allowed to watch Netflix or BBC iPlayer. She will whinge. Oh, please, but I really want to. Please, 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 please. Can I? So to whinge means to moan, to groan, and to complain in a very irritating or whiny fashion. Oh, stop whinging. You promised no whinging today. If you whinge anymore, then you're not going to be allowed to... No more whinging. Stop whinging. I'm not whinging. Stop whinging. Whinging. Do you know anyone who whinges a lot? What do they whinge about? Next is the phrase, wind your neck in. Wind your neck in. If you want to tell someone to not concern themselves with issues that don't directly affect them, huh? you might tell them to wind their neck in. Basically, mind your own business. So this classic phrase is another way of telling someone that their opinion is not appreciated. Wind your neck in and stop being so nosy. To be honest, I only ever heard this phrase being used by my friends from Northern Ireland and I hadn't heard it before that. Wind your neck in, as they would say. I would say, wind your neck in, and in Northern Ireland, wind your neck in. Wind your neck in. Wind your neck in. Hey, shut up. Wind your neck in. Basically, shut up, mind your own business, and, and stop saying, you know, you've got no business talking about this. Okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, okay, we've got a few left. A wind-up merchant. Oh, he's a real wind-up merchant. Some, a a wind-up merchant is someone that makes comments just to wind people up, just to spark or create controversy or argument. That kind of person might be labelled a wind-up merchant. The kind of person who says things just to make everyone angry or to create an argument. 
So the uh, a, a merchant is normally someone who sells something, someone who deals in something. If you are a wind up merchant, it's some. It means that you you basically deal in um, in wind up in winding people up. If you're winding someone up, you're making them tense or irritated, a bit like the way you might wind up a toy. And then you let it go and... So to wind someone up like that. Okay. Um, so there's two meanings of wind up. To wind someone up is to um, make fun of someone or to take the mickey out of them. But it also means to make them tense and uptight. And a wind up merchant is someone who who makes people uptight or who makes fun of people. Mm hmm. Stop being such a wind up merchant and be serious for a second. I was like, oh, I'm fed up with him. He's such a wind up merchant. So someone who's making fun of people all the time or someone who makes people uptight and tense is a wind up merchant, someone who winds people up. OK, do you know anyone like that? And uh, how do they wind you up? Is it just that they're annoying or are they always making fun of you? Who do you know that you do you work with anyone who's always winding people up? And here we are now at the last. This is the last item in the list. Finally, I'm going to conclude this series that I started what feels like four years ago now in pre COVID times. Remember that Ah, in the long, long ago in the good old days. And the word is zonked, which is how I feel now after having to explain all of that stuff. If you feel zonked, it means you feel exhausted or tired. For example, I was going to go out tonight, but when I finished work, I was absolutely zonked. Other words for zonked include knack knackered, worn out or shattered. You know what? I'm just going to stay in and stay on the sofa this evening because I'm absolutely zonked. I'm absolutely knackered. I'm absolutely worn out. I'm absolutely shattered. I would use all of those phrases. And that's how I feel now after this long episode. Ah, oh, I'm absolutely zonked now. But we're not finished yet because as I said before, with my itchy nose, as I said before, I'm going to test you now. Okay? All right. How am I going to do that? Here's how I'm going to do that. So uh, if you're looking at the YouTube version, uh, I will no longer dis if you're looking at the YouTube version, you can't see the um, the script and stuff on the screen now. All right, but I'm going to continue looking at it. I'm going to go back to the original independent article. Uh, so I can use that as the basis of my little test here. So here we go. What is the correct uh, expression? Can you tell me? So you might say to someone, um, everything's fine. Everything's totally fine. Everything's a okay. It's all okay. It's tick what? It's tick. It's tickety boo. Another example of all the lies that Boris Johnson has told that last one really sort of wins the prize for the worst one he's done yet. It really takes the biscuit. Yeah. Um, next, I'm going to go backwards. Uh, oh, I'll tell you what, I'm absolutely knackered. I'm exhausted. I'm z what? I'm zonked. That's right. Um, next is, uh, oh, I'm so fed up with him. He's never serious. He's such a, uh, mm, he's such a wind up merchant, isn't he? Or never mind, keep, uh, you know, uh, never mind, be quiet. It's none of your business. Wind what? Wind your neck in. That's right. What about someone who's always moaning, complaining? I don't want to do anything. Stop. What? Stop whinging. How about this? Hey, look at this. Look, I've got two free tickets to the game. How did you man? How did you them? How did you wangle them? Another one. Um, uh, oh, you dropped the cake on the floor, you stupid. W Not wanker. No. Oh, you silly Wally. Mm hmm. Next, just blah, blah, blah. Get to the point. Too much 
Too much waffle. Yeah. Um, are you serious? No, I'm not serious. I'm just taking the. I'm just taking the Mickey. Are you taking the Mickey out of me? For example. Um, next is. Uh, yeah, to be honest, uh, at school, I, I just, you know, kept my head down and just did lots of studying. Really, Yeah, I was a bit of a, hmm, to be honest. I was a bit of a swat, to be honest. Next one is, um, yeah, well, you know, like, uh, I, got, I got a pay rise at work and, you know, I just thought I deserved to treat myself to something. So, yeah, you know, what? I, I hmm, hmm, on a new guitar, I... S I splashed out on a new guitar. All right. So, like, sorry. Can you um, another example? Another another one um, means go to the toilet. It's a polite way to mean go to the toilet. For example, I'll oh, just bear with me a second. I just want to go and s spend a penny. Uh, tell you what, you raising that question certainly disrupted all the plans. You really threw a hmm in the hmm, didn't you? You threw a spanner in the works with that one, didn't you? All right. Another one is like, oh, I, had, I, I was bringing in the plate of toast I'd made and I dropped it on the floor. And of course, all of the toast landed butter side down. It's, it's, it's mm, law. It's sod's law, isn't it? So I tell you what, I don't trust him. No, he's a bit of a smarmy git, isn't he? Hmm. Very charming and like, hello, what can I do for you? Smarmy bastard. I tell you what, when I came back into the class after the grammar lesson, they were all like that on the table. All slumped over on the table. I know. Well, you know, it just shows, doesn't it? Grammar can be a good weapon. If you want to stop someone, someone's coming at you with a knife, quickly whip open a grammar book and read one of the random pages. Right? How would you? Do, how would that work? Uh, I don't have a grammar book to hand. Quick, get a grammar book. Okay. So this is what you do in the event of a knife attack. In the event of a knife attack, just whip open a grammar book and just read some of the pages from it. We use the active verb to say what the subject does. Uh, we use a passive verb to say what happens to the subject. Uh, when we use a, the passive, who or what causes the action is often unknown or unimportant. And if we do say who or does uh, the action, we use by as well. At that point, the, the knife murder is like, oh, you know what? Pfft, can't be bothered. Um, um, how did I get to that? <laughs> oh, that's it. You just keep reading grammar at them. And eventually, they'll just slump over like that and drop. The knife will drop from their hand. It's a police technique. It should be anyway. Slumped. Next is the word is a word that means when you don't go to school or you avoid school or you, you avoid work. Mm. Skiving, skiving off. Yeah. Francois Hollande's tie wasn't straight. Some of the pictures in my pod room, they're not straight. They're a bit skew-whiff, skew-whiff. It's a weird one, isn't it? Someone's getting all annoyed, irritable in the morning. Like, why did you leave these things here? You shouldn't leave these things here. All right, all right. Don't get so shirty with me. Look at the state of your bedroom. It's an absolute sh in here. Not shithole, no. It's an absolute shambles. Okay, you go to the pub, you'd say, don't worry, lads, I'll get the first... What? I'll get the first round. You win some money. Hey, look, I just won £100 on the lottery. Oh, quid's in. Someone's talking, saying some things, and you don't... You think it's nonsense. You can say, honestly, what a load of... Poppycock. Complete nonsense. What's an expression that means someone has died? Sort of a slightly disrespectful one. Do you, uh, did you hear what happened to, uh, to Dave's? Uh, did you hear what happened to Dave? Yeah, piano landed on his head. Yeah, he, he what? He popped his clogs. Mm-hmm. 
If you've drunk too much, oh, I'll tell you what, mate, I'm going to have to go home. I'm feeling too, what? Feeling too pissed. Pissed off, meaning annoyed. It's the first day of the month and you've got an annoying friend and your friend comes down from the bedroom and it's the first day of the month. What do they say? They say, mm, mm, a pinch and a punch, the first of the month. And a slap and a kick. What is it? For being too quick. Okay. And what about when it's very, 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 very foggy? Extremely foggy, a big thick fog. It's a, it's a real pea super out there, isn't it? Okay, that's it. We've done it. We did it. We got there in the end. That is the end of this mega series that only took me f about four years to complete. 88 English expressions that will confuse everyone. Let me know in the comments section if you knew any of these phrases already. I'm sure that you knew some of them. Let me know which ones you're going to keep. Let me know uh, which ones you're... Well, just let me know which ones you're going to keep. Give me some examples. Answer some of the questions I asked you during the episode. Uh, Francesco, I hope you appreciated this, if you're still there. Maybe he's a, maybe he's a skeleton scrum, slumped over, just still waiting for me to do this series. But Francesco, leave a comment to let us know that you are not a skeleton. Okay, everybody. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will speak to you again in the next part of this uh, podcast project, uh, this ongoing project. Uh, it's a podcast. That's what it is. And I will speak to you soon. Okay, everybody. Thank you. And take care out there in podcast land. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.